Let's switch focus to Essos for a little while now and go backwards in time. Back to about 5,000 years before Aegon I. And let's explore the region of Essos that his people, the Targaryens, came from. So once upon a time, here on the Valyrian Peninsula in southern Essos, there were some peaceful shepherd-type dudes. They grazed their herds on the slopes and valleys between the 14 fires. Now, the 14 fires are literally 14 active volcanoes that ring around the peninsula. And in a stroke of the most amazing luck in all of history, the Valyrian people, these poor shepherds, find dragons layering in and around these volcanoes. Now, this next part is never really explained. They somehow tamed the dragons and learned magic as a consequence. Or, they already knew magic and used it to tame the dragons. So, which came first, the chicken or the egg, the dragons or the magic? Some people say that dragons bring magic. After all, when Daenerys Targaryen visits the fabled city of Karth with her three newborn dragons, magic returns to the sorcerers of the city who hadn't been able to perform any magic in a long damn time. Or maybe it was Danny's natural magic that hatched the eggs in the first place. Maybe there is something in the bloodlines of the Valyrians that perhaps magically connects them to the dragons, because it was a well-known fact that only people with Valyrian blood could ride or tame a dragon. They were known as the Dragon Seed. In any case, the bottom line is that the Valyrians figured out a way to use both magic and dragons to create allegedly the most sophisticated and magnificent civilization that Planetos had ever seen. I mean, this idea isn't out of the realm of possibility. On the TV show, we see that the Starks of Winterfell seem to be able to magically connect with their direwolf pets, and Bran Stark can see visions. So it's entirely plausible that the Valyrians are magically gifted in some way as well. Before we go any further in exploring the Valyrians, I'm sure many of you are wondering what the hell I'm doing making a huge time jump forward by 3,000 years. After all, the timeline would indicate that the Long Night ended about 8,000 years BC, and we're picking the story back up with the rise of the Valyrian Freehold in about 5,000 BC. So yeah, what the hell was this whole continent up to for about 3,000 years? Let's start our exploration at the far eastern end of the map. When we last left these people, it was the end of the Long Night, and the once prosperous Empire of the Dawn in far eastern Essos had fallen because of the actions of the Bloodstone Emperor, which might have actually caused the Long Night in the first place, but we'll cover that story in a later video. In this 3,000 year period, a new empire would rise from the ashes of the Empire of the Dawn and call itself the Golden Empire of Yi Ti. The Golden Empire would never be as big or fabulous as its predecessor, but it was able to build itself up to be prosperous and stable, and to this day is still fantastical. They still have crazy amounts of wealth and access to the most exotic spices and fabrics, but they became insular and isolated, untrusting of the neighbors around them. Kinda like the old emperor of China in real life. The people of Yi Ti did trade with other cultures, and they still do, but they stayed in their borders and for the most part didn't really share their history with other people. Because our history is written by a Westerosi maester, we have no real idea what the history of this place is. We can only give you a vague idea. There was another major player that came up in Essos around this 3000 year time period. and They were called the Giscari Empire. Now, for the show watchers out there who haven't read the books, the Giscari are the dudes who worshipped the Harpy, practiced slavery, and they made the Unsullied. So, it's clear that the old Giscari Empire had many familiar aspects to it that the show watchers will recognize. The Giscari of today still worship the Harpy, they still keep slaves, and they still live in pyramids. So, just use the people of Slaver's Bay in the TV show to give you an idea of what the old Giscari Empire was like. 
Daenerys goes to this area called Slaver's Bay and conquers three cities, Astapor, Yunkai, and Marine. These three cities, along with New Gis, are actually the remnants of the old Giscari Empire, which was much bigger and more powerful than these current four cities combined. The thing about the Giscari is that they were the main enemy of the Valerians. So for about 3,000 years, the Giscari were building up the most powerful empire in the east and were virtually unopposed. And then the Valerians got dragons in about 5,000 BC, and suddenly it was on. Because in the game of being the baddest in town, there can't be two big dogs on the block. So the Valerian Freehold and the Giscari Empire square off. It's all out war for 300 years as the Valerians and Giscari go toe to toe in five different massive wars. And despite the fact that the Giscari have a much larger army comprised of hordes and hordes of trained slaves, predecessors to the Unsullied that we see in the show, the Valyrians and their dragons ultimately come out victorious each time. I mean, dragons are kind of the atomic bomb of this world. Finally, at the end of the Fifth Giscari War, the Valyrians just utterly destroyed the capital of Old Gis, literally tearing it down and burning it to the ground. Then they poured salt and sulfur on the ground around the city so that nothing would grow there and to add insult to injury, they decorated the place with skulls just to prove that they were the baddest in the land. This last war took place around 4700 BC. So now that the Guscari were wiped out, the Valyrians turned their attention to another civilization they hoped to subjugate, the Roinar. Remember how from before I was telling you that the Roinar were the ones who taught the Andals how to forge steel and iron? Well, these guys were more than just some dudes who were good with metal and boat making. The Roinar were this sophisticated, advanced, river-based civilization that sprang up along this huge river, the Roin, or Mother Roin as they called it. And the descriptions were given of this civilization remind me a bit of ancient India, at least the parts of ancient India that sprang up around the mighty river Ganges. Sidebar, the Ganges is actually called Ganga in Hindi. See, I teach you stuff too. It's not all just dragons and nerd stuff. Here are some other interesting facts about the Roinar that make them a really super cool civilization. Unlike the rest of the world, men and women were considered equals in their society in terms of inheritance and ownership. They were famous for fine craftsmanship and world-renowned art, dancing, and poetry. They used water magic, which we're told is pretty much the opposite of the type of blood and fire magic that the Valyrians used. Anyway, the people of the Rhoyne lived in relative peace for thousands of years until about 950 BC when the slow growth of the Valyrian freehold finally caused the two great civilizations to clash, with Valyria ultimately coming out victorious in the end. These Rhoynish wars were almost as intense as the wars against the Giscari Empire, and they would last for almost 250 years until the Rhoynars could take no more. In the end, they were either all killed, enslaved, or they abandoned their beloved river and fled. And the Valyrians completely ruined their leftover cities, once again using the tactic that they'd used on Old Gis. They poured salt and sulfur on the ground just to make extra sure that the Roinar could never rebuild their homes. The few remaining survivors of the final Great War piled into about 10,000 random ships and, led by their last surviving princess, Nymeria, they sailed the high seas looking for a new home. Eventually, after some pretty intense and deadly misadventures, in about 700 BC, the Roinar survivors ended up in Dorne in Westeros. Princess Nymeria and Lord Mors Martell eventually got married and she crowned him the Prince of Dorne, which is why to this day the leaders in Dorne are called Prince or Princess and why some of the Dornish people have accents and light brown skin are generally just so different when compared to the rest of the people of Westeros. That's because they're descendants of the mix of white-skinned first men and brown-skinned Roinar. It's kind of like how you'd imagine a culture that's a mix of Europeans and Indians might be. 
And the migration of the Rhoynar actually brings us to the fall of Valyria and the rise of the Targaryen dynasty in Westeros. The story of the fall of Valyria actually starts about 200 years after the Valyrians annihilated the Rhoynar, as the free city of Bravos is founded by ex-slaves that escaped their dragon lord masters. Now, if you don't remember, Bravos is the city in which Arya is doing her faceless man training. So at this point in the story, the Valyrians had conquered most of western Essos, establishing massive cities all around the region. But from the time Bravos is founded, the Freehold had entered into a state of decay that would slowly take place over the course of 300 years and lead to its downfall. Now let's do a little gossiping about these Valyrians, shall we? They had colossal amounts of wealth that they had stolen from all the different civilizations that they conquered, and they concentrated it all in the capital city of Valyria. It's very much like the Roman Empire on, in Earth history. All roads lead to Rome. Well, in this case, all roads lead to Valyria. But the crappiest thing about the Freehold, and even the Roman Empire, was that it was powered by really brutal slavery, and in the case of the Valyrian Freehold, also seriously wicked blood magic. So the sucky thing about magic is that it takes a lot of stuff to do it. And I know I sound vague, so let me get specific. What I mean is you really have to be willing to do a serious amount of hard work, train for years, and be willing to sacrifice pretty much everything you hold dear to wield magic. You know, as my dad always said, there's no such thing as a free lunch. As evidence of this, let's think about what terrible lengths people like Melisandre will go to in order to perform magic. She had to give birth to a shadow baby, which didn't look very comfortable. I'm sure it was probably painful for her. And she talks a lot about the importance of blood sacrifice to performing powerful magic. And you all remember what she did to Gendry and later what she did to Shireen Baratheon on the show, right? Or there's Varys getting his junk cut off by a wizard so that the wizard could talk to a voice from the flames. These are all examples of sacrifices needed to be made in order for those magic wielders to actually use their magic. Oh, and we can't forget the biggest example of sacrifice that led to something magical happening. And of course, I'm talking about Daenerys killing Miri Mazdor on Khal Drogo's funeral pyre and hatching her three dragons. In season one, the Lazarene priestess Miri Mazdor tries to heal Khal Drogo's injuries, but requires the sacrifice of Danny's unborn baby to ensure that Drogo survives. All that the sacrifice of the baby achieved was that Khal Drogo was left basically a brain dead vegetable. So, I hope that you can see the point I'm trying to make. In order to make magical stuff happen, you need a bunch of blood sacrifice. And it can't just be any blood, it's got to be real good blood. Whatever that means. Anyway, the Valyrians required magic to make their whole civilization run. And in order to gather all the supplies needed to fuel all this magic, they had enormous slave populations. They would force their slaves to go deep into the heart of the 14 fires. Remember, that's the ring of active volcanoes that shaped the Valyrian Peninsula. And in there, the slaves would dig for precious metals and gems. And as you can imagine, working closely with active volcanoes means that vast numbers of these slaves died horrific deaths. And honestly, just from an engineering perspective, it really isn't all that smart to mine around volcanoes, especially when those volcanoes are basically holding up your city. So maybe there's a actual scientific reason why the doom of Valyria happened. Because yeah, I'm sure you figured it out. At some point, this awesome gravy train of magic and dragons and money and power, it had to come to an end for the people of Valyria. And that tragic ending was aptly called the Doom of Valyria. You know what they say about all good things, right? They end in a fiery death inferno because literally over a dozen volcanoes blew the F up at the same time. Sorry. But what happened to the Valerians? Did they all die? Well, 
Yes and no? See, Valyria itself might have been destroyed, but the Valyrians had conquered a bunch of existing cities and built some new ones of their own all over western Essos. So any Valyrians who had been living in a different area than the Valyrian Peninsula proper would have survived in cities like Volantis and Lys. But none of these people had dragons. So what about the dragons then? Did any of them survive the doom? Okay, let's explore that a little bit. Valyria's nobility was made up of about 40 families that actually owned or rode dragons. Because not everyone was cool enough or rich enough or magical enough to be dealing with dragons. It's that thing that we talked about before. Some people are dragon seed and something about their genetics or maybe their souls or something like that connects with the dragon and basically controls them. And those 40 dragon seed families, of them, only the Targaryens and their small handful of dragons and a bunch of eggs actually survived this apocalypse. The rest of Valyria's dragons died in the doom, which apparently was so hot that even dragons burned. Now, some of you might be asking, how were the Targaryens spared from the same fate as the rest of their people? Well, that story is actually pretty cool. So in about 126 BC, Danis Targaryen, who was the daughter of Lord Aenar Targaryen, had a really messed up dream that kept on coming back to her every night. And that dream was actually a vision or a prophecy of the doom of Valyria. Danis, who was also called Danis the Dreamer, was totally disturbed by this vision, and eventually she tells her father about it. Now, Danis's dad, Aenar, could have been a total jerk about this, but he actually believes her, and he gathers up all his family, his servants, two vassal houses that would be his two houses that are bannermen to him, and he takes all his dragons and all their eggs and moves them to three teeny tiny islands in this place called Blackwater Bay, in this backwater of Westeros. Once the Targaryens and their friends arrive in Blackwater Bay, they assign their followers to their own islands. House Valerion goes to Driftmark Island, and House Celtigar goes to Claw Isle. The Targaryens themselves build a fortress on the island of Dragonstone, because this island had a volcano on it, and their dragons loved to chill in it. So the Targaryens wound up staying on Dragonstone with their vassal houses around them on their little islands for about 12 years before Danis's dream finally came true and their hometown of Valyria was annihilated. I'm sure there were times they probably felt crazy for having left the beautiful homeland, but eventually when the doom came, they must have been so grateful that they actually followed Danis's dream and escaped before anything bad happened to them. It would be another 114 years before the descendants of those Targaryens, Aegon and his two sister wives, Rhaenys and Visenya, would conquer Westeros. And that ends another period of history. Up next, the Targaryen rule of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. <laughs>